All right, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Bankston. I'm the policy director at New America's Open Technology Institute, and I'll be moderating uh, the last panel of the day. Thank you for sticking around for it. Um, we'll have a reception after. Um, so far today, we've talked about security at the personal level in our first panel and uh, at the international and national levels in our second and third panels. Uh, now we're going to jump back a couple le levels to talk about security at the institutional level and the threats that companies and nonprofits are facing uh, from their attackers. Uh, and so we have a wonderful panel of some really high powered folks who are going to talk to you uh, about those advanced persistent threats. And I'm going to briefly organize them. Uh, Sherry McGuire here on the end is Vice President for Global Government Affairs and Cybersecurity Policy uh, at a tiny little security company called Symantec. Symantec, is that? Yes. Um, where she leads their global public policy agenda, uh, including cyber. Um, Angela McKay, right next to me, uh, similarly works for a tiny little uh, scrappy startup <laughs> called Microsoft, where she's Director of Cyber uh, Security Policy and Strategy in the Global Security Strategy and Diplomacy team. Um, many of you uh, are now familiar with Alex Stamos, uh, who after <laughs> um, co-founding two successful security consulting companies, uh, ISEC Partners and Artemis Internet, uh, recently joined a, a little web play called Yahoo uh, as their chief information security officer. And then uh, finally, we have Morgan Marquis-Bois, uh, who last year <laughs> Uh, became a director of security for First Look Media. Um, congratulations to your colleague Laura Poitras on her Oscar win for Citizen Four last night. Um, and uh, he joined First Look after spending many years at Google working on fending off threats from nation states, including working on the team that dealt with the Aurora operation, uh, which originated, as far as we know, with Chinese intelligence and which at some point all of the companies represented on this panel either investigated or were targeted by, um, and is a good example of the topic of this panel, which is advanced persistent threats. We have a wide variety of threats online in terms of cyber. There are unsophisticated attacks by script kitties who are doing denial of service attacks. There are opportunistic attacks going after particular vulnerabilities at particular times. But then there are the um, very well-resourced or sophisticated players who, uh, like nation states or, or organized crime, that pick a particular target for financial or ideological uh, or, or other reasons and then pound and pound and pound on the door until they get in. Uh, and so I just wanted to start the panel with the basic question of what is an advanced persistent threat and is it actually a useful way of talking about cyber threats or should we just go ahead and go to the reception? Angela. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of what you said, Kevin, there in your description of kind of well-resourced, working over time and targeting a particular victim is a good way of thinking about the so-called advanced persistent threat. But I do think that that term itself is a significant misnomer. You know, there are adversaries who are very agile and adaptive. They want to go in, get their stuff, and get out. There are ones who want to, um, they are determined and again, working towards a particular target, but not necessarily really using advanced techniques. You know, if you are looking across the surface area of not an in, just an individual company, but also all their vendor relationships, ultimately there are going to be some challenges in managing those environments. And so not all actors have to be particularly advanced. And so I think it's helpful to, to, to understand that there are sophisticated and well-resourced actors, <clears throat> but then different tactics and techniques that they use in order to execute those. Um, one of the things that I think is really funny is, you know, as a security community, the phrase um, increasing number and sophistication of cyber attacks has been something everyone has been saying for over 20 years. Um, but what has really changed in, uh, I think, the environment more recently, and particularly in the awareness in the public domain, is the role that nation states play and how that really escalates the overall threat landscape. Um, one of the terms, uh, something that our general counsel has said that is that you know, government snooping is potentially could be characterized as an advanced persistent threat. And in many ways, it's not just the government snooping, it's when you have a particular adversary, whether it's a government or a criminal unit, that can really dedicate time resourcing and programmatics to execute an attack, that's something to be seriously concerned mm -hmm. about. Well, in terms of government snooping or, or, or state-sponsored hacking, um, 
This is something that Morgan has a great deal of experience with, uh, defending Google's network against the Chinese, um, dealing with research on how Syria uses uh, malware to uh, infect the laptops of dissidents and rebels. Um, and The Intercept just published, uh, at first look, just published a fascinating and worrisome story about GCHQ, supported by NSA, stealing the encryption keys of millions of SIM cards. So your specialty is dealing with state-sponsored attacks, which, if you use the APT terminology, is definitely advanced and definitely persistent. What insights do you have into government as an APT? Uh, so I, I think the term APT was, was actually pretty useful uh, sort of around the time of the Aurora incident when it was sort of really popularized, I think, by a lot of the work that Mandiant, Mandiant did at the time. Um, I, I think that it's, it's less useful now because it, it, it's sort of inaccurate, right? Like, um, uh, you know, people have talked about the Sony hack, uh, advanced, highly debatable. Um, you, you know, like a lot, of what, a lot of the time what we see is, is uh, you know, state actors is, is heavily persistent. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about the Gamalto hack a little bit later when we, when we actually talk about encryption. But I, I had a, a teammate who characterized the APT thing like this, sort of advanced US Russia, persistent China, threat Israel. Um, <laughs> which I kind of actually always liked, right? Um, and, and so, so I, I think that, you know, to, to call, I mean, um, I think in the previous panel, um, I think it was Nick or Nate from uh, Ingame talked about the sort of blended threat landscape that we're seeing now. Um, so I think that calling any state actor an advanced persistent threat actually casts a skew on how we sort of appreciate their craft, because you only really want to be as good as you need to be in order to be effective, right? And so it sort of lends to this trend in reporting, which is really odd, and that whenever you know, a reporter wants to discuss a nation state hack, they're always like, so how sophisticated do you think it is? It's like, not, not how effective was it, mm -hmm. but how sophisticated is it? Like this is like the sort of the magic thing that everyone wants to get at when they talk about an advanced persistent threat. So I don't actually find it a very useful term to use these days. Um, however, having said that, you know, like what we what we describe as APT is you know sort of state-sponsored hacking, and I, I'd say that's obviously exceptionally prevalent at the moment. Mm -hmm. Either of you want to jump on the bandwagon and, and dump on the term APT? <laughs> or is it, is it abuse? Well, I do, I do think it's highly overused these days, no. and certainly it is, if something is advanced and persistent and a threat, then it could come from anywhere. So I think by designating it almost default these days, which, oh, if it's an APT, it must be nation state, uh, sometimes it might actually give too much credit to the nation state that's launching the attack, because it may not be very advanced. It may just simply be taking advantage of uh, holes in a network or a not very secure system. So I think you know, we, we probably need to ratchet down on what that definition actually means. And, uh, but it, it does give folks, I think, a general sense of um, uh, whether or not something is serious and should be taken seriously. But once it becomes too overused, then nobody knows what it means or what to do in response to it. So too, too overused these days. I think it would be useful if we actually updated our thought on what advanced means, but it seems like the term APT is still stuck in the 2009 definition, whereas what the Chinese did in Aurora is now within the realm of every you know, Eastern European game store in an Adidas tracksuit has that capability <laughs> now, right? Um, and you know, things like computational, uh, can, can somebody crack an unlimited number of NTLM hashes used to be something that was interesting and now anybody can either buy the GPUs or rent them from Amazon Web Services with a cred credit card. Um, so Bruce Schneier, I think, was, had a good point about what we see from the NSA right now is what we'll see from criminals three, four years ago. So if, if we want to continue to use the term advanced prison threat, I'd redefine advanced as um, semi-autonomous disconnected malware, malware that has the ability to jump air gaps and to do its mission without command and control, um, which, you know, 90% of the anti-APT stuff that you buy for a network is all about command and control detection. And so whether or not your systems are actually air-gapped, utilizing the techniques that you see in Flame and Stuxnet and such to have extremely quiet command and control mm -hmm. systems is going to be useful for criminals, not just for governments that are attacking disconnected nuclear facilities. Um, and then things like persistence off of the hard drive, right? Like if you look at a, a, a MacBook Pro, like. Uh, this lady's using up front, a MacBook Air, that has something like 25 different places where you can put state on it outside of the hard drive, mm -hmm. right? The Thunderbolt controller. Um, 
and the reprogrammable keyboard controller and the boot prom and all this crazy stuff. And so that's what we've seen out of the NSA equation group, as has been discussed, is the ability to have pluggable modules to take over hard drive firmware. I think we'll start to see that of, of, firm, of attacks that survive reboots, re survive rebuilds, that exist in the frame of the computer for the lifetime of that system. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think APT could be useful if we actually redefine it as what is the cutting edge now, which is no longer, honestly, the Chinese or the Russians. It's, it's what we're learning about NSA. And does APT do anything for us that state-sponsored actor could really do? I mean, it, I mean, it, essentially, yeah. we, we used APT to discuss state attacks from China. I mean, really, right? it was to get venture capital. Right, yeah. yeah. So, so that's the actual yeah. usefulness. <laughs> so perhaps uh, APT is not a useful term unless you tag it with a year. This was an APT <laughs> as of 2012. Yeah. Right, yeah. 2014 is a different matter. But OK, so we have advanced threats. We have persistent threats. We have some serious threats that are neither. So the question is, what do we do in the policy environment, since we are in DC and we should talk about policy, um, what do we do in the policy environment to try and address that? One of the, uh, perhaps the most discussed policy um, proposal in regard to dealing with cybersecurity threats is our proposals around information sharing. Um, at this point, we're, we're four or five years into a legislative debate over whether or not we need legislation that would provide a lot of liability protection to incentivize and allow for uh, <laughs> private companies to share more information with the government. Uh, the president just signed an executive order also encouraging such sharing and trying to make it easier for the government to share information with companies. Um, CISPA, the somewhat notorious CISPA, uh, at least in privacy advocacy communities, uh, was reintroduced for the third time uh, earlier this year. There's a new bill from the Senate Intelligence Committee coming any moment, and the administration itself has its own proposal. Um, what do we make of these proposals? Do we need uh, this type of legislation? And what, if any, privacy concerns might there be around such uh, legislation? Sherry just testified on the topic. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts you'd share here. Sure. So uh, first off, information sharing will not cure all the world's ills in cybersecurity. I just want to put that out there first. Uh, everyone seems to think it is the magic pill that will uh, cure all the problems. It will not. It is simply a tool uh, to give uh, those who may be participating in whatever information sharing organization is set up, it is a tool by which to hopefully learn more about a uh, common op operating picture or common attack picture and then maybe some ways that you can protect yourself. So I think first off the big misnomer is that information sharing will fix everything and it won't. That being said, however, uh, there are some valuable lessons learned from information sharing that's gone on in the past. So if we look at things uh, that, for example, the financial services sector has been able to do with the information sharing and analysis center over the last seven or eight years, they've actually been able to share some of the common attack patterns, uh, some of the uh, malware samples, et cetera, that, that helps all of them to protect their networks in a more effective way. When we get to talking about information sharing in the context around privacy, though, that really is about the private sector sharing with the government. And uh, there are some significant concerns there around privacy issues. We've called for, for many years now, that any information that is shared by private industry sh to the government should, in fact, be minimized and stripped of all PII. Not everybody is uh, of that same mindset, which, frankly, has been a bit of a surprise to us in the private sector. This seems like a natural thing to do to protect our customers and their information. Um, the other thing that I will say is that we've also had some great success working with law enforcement. And uh, some of the big botnet takedowns that we've seen have, in fact, been international consortiums. Actually, Symantec has worked with Microsoft and a num number of other companies with the FBI, with Europol, and other academic organizations to, to, take, to identify the command and control servers um, sink all the information and, and take some of these offline. So there's, there are real, I think, positive proof points, but there's also the privacy concerns that we, any legislation that is passed, frankly, needs to take into account and have as a fundamental foundation, privacy and civil liberty protections. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that sh should be up for debate. I tend to agree, but <laughs> let's not talk about us. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I will say, uh, at the Cyber Summit, there was a panel that, that your CEO was on where he agreed with uh, Jennifer Granick, professor at Stanford, who's also a, a privacy advocate, um, that in the vast majority of cases, the information that the companies want to share and want to receive is not going to include any private content, is not going to include any PII, which 
leads to the natural question, then why is it so hard to convince the Congress to include strong PII stripping uh, clauses in these bills? I mean, if most of the time you're not even going to need to remove anything, why is it such a big deal? Um, a mystery that perhaps one of the sponsors of the bills can, can See, answer. I, I actually found that very interesting as well as someone who spent a lot of time on the sort of incident response minds. Um, so, so when we, we share sort of indicators of compromise, which is presumably what the government is, is asking people to share, traditionally this takes the form of, you know, an address of a command and control server, or an, you know, sort of a, a hash or an identifier for a piece of malware that an adversary has used. Um, like whether or not you're actually purchasing Intel from a company that's sort of providing you with threat data, or whether or not you're sharing it between you, it's th this is you know by and large sort of 90% of the data that's shared, and it, it doesn't contain email content, it contains no email addresses and that type of thing. So it actually does beg a very interesting question: why why the bill needs to be that broad? Actually, why there isn't those protections? Uh, because I don't I don't think it's needed at all. Alex, where do you think information sharing falls in the hierarchy of needs when it comes to cyber? <laughs> um, so definitely, uh, I, I, I was a CS prof uh, major, so I, I don't have my entire uh, psychology, the exact wording, but um, it's definitely not one of the important things. It's not, I, I think it's pretty clear that information sharing is what we all talk about because it's easy in milk toast and doesn't require almost any work. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> we've been talking about it for years. Uh, and of my top 10 things that the government could do that wouldn't break the top 10, maybe it's in the top 20. I mean, we, we already do information sharing privately with co like-minded companies, with tech companies, uh, with, uh, with all the companies up here who have indicators of compromise, like uh, Morgan said, has no PII or privacy impact. Um, and there's nothing has stopped us from doing that. We're not asking for any legal protection there. Um, and so I, I don't think information sharing is gonna do much. I think there are other places where the government can actually uh, put its muscle to do more things to, to, to bend the curve a little bit. If you could pick one place where the government would put some muscle, or two or three. Um, I, I mean, one of the biggest things, as we've heard from the last panel, is it, it's pretty much impossible to hire folks right now with any kind of background, unless there's maybe four or 5,000 people in North America that I could hire to do the highly technical work mm -hmm. that our, our team does. Um, and uh, I think that means that we need to have security engineering as a basic part of people's computer science training, right? So like the fact that computer science departments all over the country are graduating people without any security exposure is like a truck driving school teaching you everything but how to use the brakes, right? <laughs> um, and, and that's a place where government has a really good background of you know, uh, enticing schools to teach certain things, to give uh, grants to do that. There's guys like Matt Bishop at Davis who have good ideas about how, you, how do you weave security into an undergraduate curricula. Um, in a way that it's not a separate class and it's just something you learn the entire time. Mm -hmm. I think with a little bit of funding and a little bit of enticement, you could see that done. You could see a lot more cybersecurity centers of excellence. Um, I think if we had comprehensive immigration reform, we would no longer have to hire our best security experts in other countries. They could come here and become Americans and have American kids and pay American taxes. Um, just like you know, the brain drain helped us win the 20th century, it can help us win the 21st century, right? Like the fact that everybody wants to come here is, is a soft power benefit that we should utilize. Um, and in cyber, that's completely true. Uh, I think, honestly, where I'd, I'd really like to see the government just put some dollars is cancel one F-35 and take that money and put it towards public bug bounties for open source software, right? Ooh. So bugs like shell shock and Heartbleed, right? Like, um, the government pays for bugs, but it pays for bugs in offensive purposes, like Katie talked yeah. about. It'd be nice to see an open source public bug bounty where there's clearly defined rules about what happens with the bugs and, and, and that they, they're never used for offensive purposes and somebody outside the government runs it but the government puts the money behind it um, so that we can have real top to bottom reviews of the critical open source software that is running on every single phone in this room and on every single server all of you guys are talking to right now. Um, that's, I mean, the amount, if you spent $500 million on that, you would t you know, increase by an order of magnitude the amount of money spent in the United States on software security, right? Um, and 500 million bucks is what the Pentagon pays on post-its, right? Like, you know, from a, <laughs> if this is truly like a critical national, national um, priority, then we should put the money behind it, consummate with what we spend on other uh, national defense uh, programs. Well, since, since you brought it up, I'm gonna skip one question and come back to it. And, and let's talk about this market for vulnerabilities. Katie, Katie did a talk earlier about, about bug bounty programs, uh, that, which are one type of in the market. There are states that are in the market who are buying vulnerabilities 
for offensive use, um, it leads to questions about what is the appropriate role of government uh, either in participating in this type of market or, or uh, regulating it. And it also leads to questions about what is now being called vulnerabilities equities. Uh, when the government is aware of a vulnerability, when should it hold on to it and use it, and when should it disclose it so that it can be patched? Do we have any, any thoughts on the panel on that, or on that family of issues? Yeah, I, I certainly have some thoughts here. Um, I, I think that there's a series of related issues, right? There's the, and I loved the term earlier, Alex really hit on it, how do we incent behavior towards the right kinds of things? Um, and so in the bug bounty space, there's certainly a role for bug bounties in the ecosystem. Um, I think that we have to think really carefully because governments are already participants in this process when we reference back to the earlier conversation of nation states being involved and in leveraging vulnerabilities to conduct advanced attacks. They're already in the ecosystem. So is there a government role? They're already in there. So I think we have to think about what is the constructive way to incent the right behavior. Um, in the bug bounty space, to certainly say that one of the things when Katie was actually with Microsoft that was really helpful was thinking not just about incenting vulnerability researchers to find vulnerabilities, but also incenting researchers to think about creative ways to defend systems, and also what are the different attack methods that can pass certain mitigations and so how do, you, how do you basically get the security researcher community not only to look for the vulnerabilities, but also help raise defenses? And in a related note, when you find a vulnerability, the bug bounty programs generally are saying, report that to the vendor. And I think it is really important to think about that vulnerability disclosure piece as well, because there are different, basically different philosophies around how vendors should deal with vulnerabilities once they're reported to them. Um, and that's, again, kind of rolls into that vulnerabilities equities process from government. Um, the U.S. government actually has done one thing that I think is particularly helpful in this space, is they are the only government that I have seen so far that does have a small, it was just a blog statement from Michael Daniel in April of 2014, on how the government is going to think about what they do with vulnerabilities that are reported to them. Are they going to report them to the vendors? Are they going to uh, hold them for future use? And some of the criteria that they listed is basically, is it really easy to reuse the vulnerability? You know, what are the scope of consequences? So a vulnerability that's found in uh, commercial off-the-shelf technology from you know, Microsoft or others is very different than a vulnerability that's in a unique government off-the-shelf technology. So those things have different consequences. You can direct actions in different ways. And then there's also a piece about what is the cost to society relative to the gain that you get of using the vulnerability. And again, the example here is, is really clear. When you think about Stuxnet and the set of issues that were there, there were four um, Windows vulnerabilities, zero-day vulnerabilities, and two in the industrial control systems. But I think that the challenge was in thinking about the cost to society versus the intelligence gain out of that. And, and I'm not gonna say that the determination was right or wrong, but I think what was lost in that determination was it's not just that there are these vulnerabilities. So Microsoft has cost to fix it. Then we have all of the enterprise customers who have to go patch their systems and redirect resources to that all the way down to the consumers. My grandmother, who's running a system, is also having to patch the system. So bringing in the idea of what are the full range of consequences from these vulnerabilities relative to the gain that can be used, I think is actually something that we heard that the US government is doing, and we'd certainly encourage other governments to think more about. So wasn't, wasn't there historically a, a program, like you guys have MAP, right? Yeah. Which is where you sort of notify large enterprise customers that there's sort of these vulnerabilities which are gonna be patched so they have time to you know, get their ducks in organization in a row and that sort of thing. But wasn't there an additional program where you disclosed advance notice of security vulnerabilities being patched to an undisclosed five countries? Um, and you guys did that for, for years prior to the Snowden revelations, right? Like I hear you've stopped doing that. But, but wasn't this sort of part of the evaluative process that you've just, I mean, described? Because, I mean, that was definitely going on when Stuxnet happened. So there's a, uh, there's a series of programs, MAP included, where we basically notify folks who, who develop, who have intrusion detection or intrusion protection systems, and we give them information so that when the patch comes out, 
then they, ha they can actually deploy um, protections in advance of being able to update mm -hmm. their systems. And there are national certs who are members of that program, but there are a series of criteria to be part of that program. And part of that is actually understanding how they're going to use the information for defensive purposes. So, I mean, it can be, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I've been handed a second microphone because apparently I'm not loud enough, which is not a complaint I've ever heard before, but um, <laughs> so this is obviously, it can be a complex question whether you're a vendor or a researcher or the government, do I disclose this, do I disclose it just to the vendor, do I disclose it to the public? Then there's also the question of, uh, you know, Bruce was, Bruce Schneier was talking about, you know, complexity creates security problems and we're looking at a really complex e ecosystem, so for example, um, Android gets patched very quickly, but most of your cell phones running Android are running fairly heavily customized versions of Android, so the phone vendor actually has to customize patches, and so they are actually fairly slow in getting your phone patched, and so you have, we have a pretty serious security problem uh, uh, with many of our mobile devices. Um, but it's, it's also worth noting that the President's review group on this subject uh, suggested that, that the the pendulum should swing pretty far in the direction of disclose, at least to the vendor, rather than hold on to for offensive use. But in terms of the problem of getting our stuff patched, that kind of falls under the heading of cyber hygiene, which is a word that uh, is now starting to get more currency, perhaps maybe even overused like APT. What is cyber hygiene? How do I stay cyber hygienic? Oh. Um, <laughs> just stop, just stop, stop, Kevin, please. Uh, and, and how do you feel about that in the, in, the, in the stack ranking of things we need to do to protect ourselves? So I'm happy to talk a little bit about this as well. Um, first of all, I do think that cyber hygiene is a very important thing. When you did the introduction, Kevin, you, you kind of said there's opportunistic threats and then there's this other series that are potentially advanced, potentially not, but at least determined or persistent. Um, so there is a great opportunity to raise the baseline of cyber hygiene across the, enterprise, uh, the ecosystem, whether it's enterprise or consumers. Um, there's a lot that's being done, I think, both uh, in the Windows environment as well as in other platform environments with automatic updates. So basically, systems need to be patched regularly, the firewall signatures need to be managed, need to be thinking about configuration of the systems. There's kind of some basics that have to be done. I think one of the things that, as an industry, we're really trying to grapple with, which is, what should we be doing on behalf of users, like automatic updates, and what are the things that we want to enable or inform users to make good risk decisions? And that's something where you know, the pendulum hasn't found a good equilibrium point. You know, originally, we weren't doing automatic updates in large environments because there was some concern that you know, Microsoft was being the big top-down antitrust world. But as we realized the security ecosystem is changing, that made it, you know, we realized that us we needed to help users in this space. And the same thing ac actually happened with firewalls. Used to be that a lot of systems didn't come with those turned on automatically, and now they do. And so I think that's one of the things where we just really have to grapple with what do we do as a research community to understand how people use systems and make good choices of what we need to do in the technology environment to enable that, and then how we actually give them information to make good risk decisions. The example that I know Alex heard this last week at the Cyber Summit from um, our corporate vice president is that, you know, there's a, something that pops up in the browser that says this website may not be safe. Okay, well, what do, you, what do you do with that as a user? So I think this is one where you start to see the multidisciplinary aspect. We're gonna have to bring in things like behavioral psychology to understand how users are interacting with technology and give them appropriate information to manage risk. So, so I, I've, I've involved my thinking to this point where I'm a pretty strong security paternalist. I think there's almost <laughs> no decision a user can make when you talk about helping people at the billion user scale that is safe for them to do. So, so who here has gotten the, you have, this is a bad certificate error? Right, everybody in the room. Yeah. So if you click <laughs> more information, it gives you a bunch of text. And what the browser is asking you is, is please use your knowledge of discrete mathematics and the X509 <laughs> D3 standard to make an intelligent decision. And, and since Bruce Schneier has left, um, pretty much nobody in the room is qualified to make that decision. We shouldn't, as, that's kind of a CYA as engineers. It's like we like to dump out and put 
when there's a problem like that, put it in the lap of the user. And as an industry, we have to move away from that. Security decisions like that need to be made automatically in the most, it has to fail towards the safe way, and if that means things break, they break. And, and one of the things I hate to hear, and I heard it earlier today, is the idea that security and usability are orthogonal things to shoot for, and they're not. If a product is easy to use, but when you use it, you're, you get in trouble, then it wasn't usable, right? Like, if it's really easy to drive a car, but then the car explodes after 30 seconds, that isn't a usable car. Right? Um, and we need to start thinking about that from, from a, uh, a software perspective. When we build products, they need to ship safe by default, and they have to make choices on behalf of the user, and if the user wants to have an advanced mode, they turn off patching, or they want to be able to accept SSL warnings, then you have to hide that somewhere where an advanced user will find it, and 99% of users won't. Um, and I, I hope you know, Microsoft has made movement in this direction. I hope Microsoft continues to move that direction. Um, and that other, you know, you see that, that's kind of more of a, how Apple does stuff. It's how, you know, uh, in some ways I had a big fight with the Chrome team. I hope the Chrome team was really proud that they get people to make the decision correctly 68% of the time. And that still <laughs> means 32% of the time people are in trouble. And that's not an acceptably high, you know, number. Yeah, that, that seems like the magic number. I remember that they, they, they um, that Twitter would do internal tests just to see how susceptible their employees were to phishing attacks, and about a third of them, and I mean, these are IT professionals at Twitter, and about a third of them would would uh, click that link or down or open that yeah, file. We, we do that. I'm not going to say the number, <laughs> uh, but it's to the point where you realize that passwords in a corporate environment are completely useless. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think it's important also to not just think about cyber hygiene or best practices or whatever you want to want to call it. It's not just about the technology. I mean, you can't just set it and forget it. I mean, that's not what security is today. It's constantly evolving with the threat landscape. And so with that, we also have the people and the process component of this. You know, we always talk about people, process, and technology. Well, the people component, we've, which you've just raised, is a, a critical part of this. And that is you can have the most educated, most cyber-aware group of people, and someone is possibly going to end up getting duped. Not, not because uh, of any failure on their part, but because the attackers out there are using multiple methods. It's not just a phishing email now. It's a phishing email followed up by a phone call that says, hey, I just sent you that invoice. I need you to open it really quickly. Most people wouldn't think twice about doing that, but those are the old sort of very simple social engineering practices that have been around for, for, for ages. And we just have to be aware that, in fact, if we think something is suspicious, it probably is, and just because you get pushed to the next level to maybe open it doesn't mean that you should. So one aspect of, you could call it cyber hygiene, is making sure that your data... Is it the last time you're going to use that word? Yeah, this is the last time I'm going to use that word. <laughs> Uh, oh, is, is encryption, which uh, is a, an issue that's been coming up uh, fairly regularly uh, today. Um, it, we had a debate in the 90s about whether or not we should all be able to access strong encryption without the government having the keys, and ultimately policymakers fell on the side of information security and economic security and chose to allow us to have that. Um, those are called the crypto wars. It seems like we may be on the verge of having to refight the crypto wars, uh, and I'm wondering if the panel has any perspectives on what that means for the security of their products, for the security of uh, the US internet industry and technology industry, um, et cetera. So I, I might posit that um, <laughs> while publicly we thought we'd won the crypto wars, that the intelligence community never stopped fighting them. Um, in, in that, I mean, what, what we saw recently, right, I, I, think, I think the entire framing on this issue was sort of duplicitous on behalf of uh, sort of both the NSA and law enforcement, um, because what we've seen is sort of a, a great willingness on behalf of the intelligence community to steal encryption keys liberally whenever <coughs> possible in bulk, right? So, I mean, this was the, what came out about the Gamalto hack earlier this week, or within the last week, uh, which was the sort of NSA and GCHQ stole all the crypto keys from the world's largest SIM manufacturer, right? Um, and so, so publicly you have this like, we really need some sort of legal framework to give us access to encrypted communications. And privately it's like, well, we already have access to all these encrypted communications. But if we give them an inch, then you know, they might actually take two inches. And we'd really like to get more budget and do less work. 
Um, and so I see that, and I see, for instance, you know, uh, Comey from the FBI sort of lamenting the, the pedophiles and drug dealers that will be, will be aided by the end-to-end -end encryption and Apple's iMessage and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, there's this sort of public evidence regarding the FBI's liberal breaking into people's cell phones and computers. I mean, you can always go targeted on, um, on you know, targets of interest, right? Um, and so there's a vast industry now that sells you know, targeted hacking for, for lawful intercept and lawful law enforcement surveillance. Um, and yet the, this whole debate is sort of being phrased around the fact that you know, these, these Silicon Valley companies are doing harmful things. Uh, when, when the truth is, is of course, you know, sort of internally the, the golden age of SIGINT is being celebrated. Well, it's interesting, you know, obviously uh, law enforcement does raise particular and particularly emotional examples often like child pornography, which um, horrible crime, but what they often don't talk about is, is the crimes that will be prevented by encryption. In fact, fun fact, there's a great FBI advisory to consumers during the holidays uh, that in terms of avoiding scams, they say, your phone may have encryption. You should turn that on in, in, in case your phone is stolen. Um, but I, I guess, I guess uh, Director Comey didn't read that advice. But um, <laughs> I don't know. Alex, did you have anything you wanted to expand on uh, after your Me? exchange with? Why with, would I have an opinion? Um, <laughs> uh, with the yeah, director? I, I think, I mean, so you have read a good point about the crimes at encryption. We just had a whole discussion about how APT is, is not very useful because the kind of activity you see from non-state sponsored hackers is exactly the same. And that cuts both ways. If we build products that are safe against all threat actors, then that can include governments, including our own. Um, and there's no good way to build products that are safe um, against only a couple of them and not safe against the other ones. And the, the metaphor I was using earlier that I, I didn't get to expand upon too much is, you know, it, it's, it's like the government asking us to drill a hole in a windshield and saying, oh, well, you can only let the US government through that hole. But everybody here knows if you have a hole in your windshield, eventually that whole thing's gonna crack. You can't build a system that intentionally subverts its, its own security um, for one purpose and then, and then make the whole thing safe. Uh, and um, the problem is not that technically you cannot ever have a backdoor, it's that entire models of securing users, like the iMessage model of somewhat end-to-end -end encryption, that entire model is no longer compatible with the desires to have backdoors built in. Um, and that's a great example of, uh, who here, here sends text messages uh, to people, who here has an iPhone? Who here ever sends a message that's the green bubble? Right, so the green bubble, the people you talk to are people who aren't on iMessage. Those are the most trivially sniffed things on the internet. One, they're incredibly expensive. Like, on a per byte basis, they're more expensive than the Hubble Space Telescope data <laughs> to send an SMS. But the other thing is those are sent in plain text on the control channel of the, the GSM network. Anybody with about 800 bucks of equipment and a backpack, I could have a backpack right here recording every single SMS message. I'm not doing that to all the federal agents in the room. Um, <laughs> but I could have a backpack here recording all the, the SMS messages. That's why Apple built security die message for a common sense problem that a lot of people were facing in a lot of places was their, their SMS being sniffed and a lot of bad things happening to them, not specifically for governments. And so the, you know, the next evolution of building secure products means building end-to-end -end encryption. And there's no way to do that in a way securely and include backdoors. And I think that's just the, uh, you know, there, there's a reasonable balance to be here, but the balance is not, we, we don't build secure products. That, that backpack is cheaper than 800 bucks, by the way. Really? To build yourself? Oh yeah. I mean, you need a USRP, right? <laughs> Huh? Well, I mean, yeah, like you can, you can use We'll take that one off. I mean, you can steal. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, I do think this is the issue that the ACLU's Chris Tagoyan was tweeting at when he asked the director about whether or not foreign governments are sniffing cellular traffic here in Washington, D.C., which they are. Right. Um, which everybody who went to the cyber summit, you know, well, all of our phones went crazy when the president entered the building. Yeah. So clearly it's not just the, uh, the foreign so, governments I mean, that are doing MZ catchers. I, I guess the, the, the sort of the question, right, is, is that you know, once the, you know, the, the five eyes had, had breached Gamalto and stolen all these crypto keys, um, rather than say, holy crap, you know, a lot of the people we're supposed to be protecting uh, could, be, could be targeted if someone else steals all these crypto keys. We could, we could tell Gamalto how easy it was to steal all their, all their stuff. Uh, you know, the, the, the capability is kept rather than the hole being sealed, right? And so I guess the worry is, is that, you know, if it was, you know, the Five Eyes were capable of doing it, um, then, then perhaps China and Russia are as well. Uh, and so, so, I mean, I, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room who would probably be fine with, say, 
you know, the Five Eyes is an information sharing agreement having access to these keys, but not the Russians and the Chinese. The, this, this sort of thought exercise might become different if you're like, are you fine with the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans having these keys as well as the US government? Well, I'll, I'll just say that as a certificate authority provider, we're not okay with anybody holding <laughs> keys. We don't even hold Good our you. we don't even hold our customer keys. Yeah. So even if we were asked for them on a purely practical level by governments around the world, we cannot provide them because we don't hold them. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of more policy things I'd love to hit, but we're, I do want to get to questions. So if you wanted to happen to ask a question about data breach legislation or <laughs> updating of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and how that might impact security researchers, like Katie was mentioning earlier. Feel free to ask a question about that, but I'm going to ask one more question <laughs> of the panel. Um, and I think this is starting to become one of the overriding themes of the day, which is both the sort of trust and cultural gap at this point between the East Coast and cyber policy and the West Coast and the technology industry uh, and the security research uh, community. Um, there was a story in The Hill, for example, that, that argued based on, on mostly off-the-record comments uh, from people out West that, that the Obama summit was not actually well received. Um, one person said, well, in, in, ref, in, in regard to information sharing legislation, why, would she, why should we want to share information with these people who are weaponizing our products in, in regard to the uh, firmware hack? Um, and yet at the same time, we have this desperate need for more technical expertise on the East Coast as we make these important decisions, can't we all just get along? What do we do? How do we bridge this gap? What, uh, are there any, any bright ideas on how we bridge this gap? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I mean, I feel like it, the feeling of a lot of people who work in the tech industry is that government doesn't see technology as a real profession, right? Like the Attorney General of the United States is a lawyer and the Surgeon General is a doctor and the chairman of the Detroit Chiefs led an armored division into Iraq twice, right? And, and the guy can probably field strip a M16 still. But like when you look at the leadership positions in cybersecurity, they're not people that have done the hands-on job of either breaking into or defending networks. Um, and that doesn't mean there's not a place for the lawyers and the, the foreign policy people and all the folks, but right now, pretty much 100% of the conversation is dominated by those fields. Um, and it would be nice to see more technologists in place because I think we wouldn't see as much focus on information sharing and things like liability protections if you had people that had hands-on experience, you know, spending their entire careers trying to stop cybercrime um, or protect networks against foreign governments. Um, it, it is a real profession. It's not just something you pick up, um, you know, because you're interested. It's good for your resume to spend 18 months doing cyber, right? Um, and stop using the word cyber. We respect you all a lot better. Um, <laughs> I guess I just have one thing to add, and I think this was brought up on the panel before, but I think it's a really useful thing, which is I think the folks that I've interacted with in the security research community don't always fit well within the boxes of the way government jobs are structured. What? There's a lot of process here. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of checking boxes, a lot of socialization. So earlier on the panel, I think someone brought up the idea of, you know, autonomous, making sure that people were able to work on autonomous things, not as, and then also having clear destination as opposed to being told all the different steps along the way. So I think you have to think about the things that attract folks to some of the work in private industry and how to start working to build those into the way um, government jobs that are in information security or cyber security or security itself. <laughs> I mean, the U.S. Digital Service has Relaxed done a good job of this. Codes. Like, the U.S. Digital yes. Service has done a good job of, of doing this, right, of bringing in people from Silicon Valley, like, to fix healthcare.gov and now to, to fix up other stuff. It would be nice to see a U.S. Digital Service version for cybersecurity of people who have actually done this hands-on be a part of the conversation. Yeah, I, I, I find the, the sort of the schism between Silicon Valley and uh, sort of the government and intelligence community to be the most, one of the most interesting things that's come out of the, the, the sort of the so-called Snowden revelations, right? Um, because, you know, you, you, on one hand, you've got a bunch of people trying to pass cyber policy, uh, you know, sort of sticks in the core, right? Um, and, and, and these sort of discussions about getting Silicon Valley to backdoor encryption and how they need more data, um, whereas Silicon Valley's taken a massive economic hit in the, in the wake of, of what's come out, in the wake of PRISM, um, and sort of being seen to be complicit with U.S. government for foreign policy interests, right? And so, you know, we've got Cisco taking big hits. Um, 
uh, you know, people losing contracts in, in, in Europe uh, because of the privacy laws there, um, you know, in, in Brazil, uh, losing contracts. Um, and, and so S Silicon Valley is actually sort of taking a, an economic hit, right, uh, due, due to the US government actions. Um, and I, I think that sort of lends to, you know, there's sort of a, a type of hostility to a bunch of people who are sort of passing policy that they don't really understand towards people that are sort of already losing money from their historic actions. Um, and, and as Alex so, you know, aptly pointed out, it's like none of these people, there are no technologists in positions of leadership. There's actually been a sort of a criticism sort of throughout the uh, sort of re reporting on um, a lot of the ways that uh, sort of DC, I guess, has addressed sort of policy review post Snowden, which is that there's sort of almost never any technologists actually involved in these discussions, um, which I think sort of lends itself to um, really, really damaging policy discussions. You, you do occasionally see the policymakers who say, so, sort of like in the climate change discussion, like, well, I'm not a scientist, but... I and stayed at a Holiday Inn last night, and therefore, <laughs> you know, yeah. This one time I used a computer, but... Uh, <laughs> But I do, um, I do think, though, that there, if you look at our intelligence community and others who you're talking about, there's a lot of technologists there. The issue is, how do you get a private sector perspective around the economic component of this into that equation when those decisions are being made? Right now, that discussion does not seem to be happening at all. No one is weighing, I think the president said it, what, 2009? when he released the Cyberspace Policy Review, that cybersecurity is an economic and a national security issue. But yet no one seems to be talking about the fact that right now the economic security piece is somewhat ignored. We've talked about the, the strong headwinds that US ICT companies are facing around the world because of the lack of trust in our products that have been created after the Snowden revelations, but yet if I go to chapter eight of the President's Surveillance Review Group that was all focused on things that could be done for private industry, I don't know that I can point to any of those recommendations that have actually, that action has been taken Including on today. Including a ringing endorsement of crypto. Um, if, you'd like to learn, <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about this issue of the economic cost of surveillance, funnily enough, Open Technology Institute in America has a paper on it called The Cost of Surveillance, uh, which I commend to you. But now let's go to questions uh, in the audience. Operators are standing by. Yeah, operators are standing by. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, please wait for the, the microphone. We are streaming live. Hi, um, my name is Nancy Wong. I'm a reporter. I'm a Dell News Service. So um, I'm just with all the, a lot of the cybersecurity questions have been going on around and incidents that happen. For example, Lenovo with the Superfish and everything. What, how do you think, um, what is the government's place in the private sector's cybersecurity incidents regarding like cus consumer safety issues? And do you think government should put more measures in that area to make sure that things like this don't happen again and consumers' rights are protected? Or do you think it's something that's completely should be left alone for the private sector to deal with itself? Isn't this what the FTC is for? The whole like <laughs> yeah. Lenovo Superfish thing? I, no, I mean, when I'm you talk about like <laughs> people who are technologists high up in the FTC, one of the highest up people I respect is you know, Ashkan Sultani there. Yeah. I would expect you would see FTC action yeah. on that, that kind of well within his wheelhouse. Heard it here first. Or oh, probably, yeah, no, probably I, third I or fourth. <laughs> Uh, over there. <laughs> Thank you. And Lolina, the, the Lolina group. I am actually very, very interested in your insight and opinion on amending the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, I'll, I'll start. So, you know, I spent my career as a security researcher, right, in which you're walking a line of, of finding bugs and uh, accessing systems to in a way that exceeds authorization, in a way it, because you want to make the world better. Um, and so I'm not a neutral party on this. I was a, the expert witness for Aaron Schwartz, who ended up committing suicide when he was looking down decades in jail for downloading uh, journal articles. Um, and so it seems to me if you can catch Aaron downloading too many journal articles, and if he could face decades in jail, the CFA neither needs to be broader 
nor have stronger penalties. Um, and any move to make the CFA larger to, to outlaw legitimate security research is just gonna mean that other countries are gonna be better at it, right? Like, you know, England didn't win the Industrial Revolution by outlawing steam, right? And I don't think we're gonna win the information revolution by outlawing people doing good research and information security. I think the CFA is already way too broad and is abused in a lot of situations where it shouldn't be. I don't know if anybody else has an opinion on CFA. I, I largely agree with you. I mean, I, I think what, what happened to Aaron was tragic. Um, I think it was actually kind of sad that we had to let it get to that point. Like Aaron was a, you know, a, a, a perfect victim as it were and that he was um, clearly doing something which, I mean, even the, the victim in the case declined to prosecute, right? Like, they, they were like, we don't, we don't want any of this. That was MIT. They, they didn't care that he was downloading journal articles. Um, but, I mean, prior to that, we actually saw sort of overreach uh, by the CFAA. I mean, um, so, so Weave was far less of a, a perfect victim, being a, being a notorious internet troll. I mean, however, he was, um, you know, the, the, the book was thrown at him for simply downloading documents from a website that were not password protected in any way. Um, and, and yet, I mean, so, so there's actually been sort of like a, a history of this abuse used largely to batter security researchers that the Justice Department decides they don't like for some reason, uh, which, which is, is very, very worrying. And I think how you try to reform the CFAA so that doesn't happen is, is a very difficult problem. Yeah, so it is an ironic situation if, if the law that is meant to protect cybersecurity is actually preventing research that would make cybersecurity better. Um, Katie. Um, so there are two individuals that were mentioned, you know, two individual researchers that were mentioned during that panel. But I also want to call attention to the fact that, um, you know, having started vulnerability research programs at major corporations, so started semantic vulnerability research, which would allow the researchers working for the company to report security vulnerabilities to other companies that they found. And similarly, starting Microsoft Vulnerability Research, the experience coming from those two major mega corporations and trying to knock on the front door or even find the front door in some cases of some other vendors was horrendous. And this is coming from essentially two of the biggest software companies in the world. Can you imagine what it would be like as an individual trying to scale that cliff? And that's something that I, I just want to call attention to because you guys brought up great points about those individual researchers and that is primarily what the CFAA you know, is there to, uh, to prosecute. But if you think about it, the state of security vulnerability reporting and disclosure is still in a pretty sorry state and that applies across the board. So I just wanted to make that point in case you were thinking it was about individuals. It's about organizations even trying to report vulnerabilities to other organizations. Thanks. Do you want to ask a question about data breach? <laughs> no, that's, that's all you. Go for it. Uh, or do we have any questions online? This is called a reflection attack. You're trying to... <laughs> Data breach is one of the, well, data breach. Let's not get into data breach. There is a proposal uh, from the White House on this issue, basically trying to create a federal law that governs how companies should handle it if they discover that the data is breached. What, what does Symantec think about this? Sure. So, funny enough, I testified on this also two weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we do believe that there should be a national data breach law uh, standard. Today we have over 48 different state laws, very difficult for companies that operate across borders to scale to that if, in fact, they have uh, had a breach. Uh, but uh, we also think that any breach legislation should have three components to it. And one is that it should be, they should apply equally to industry and to government or to any organization that holds PII. Today, that is not the case. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, it should uh, be linked to a baseline standard of reasonable security measures to help incentivize organizations to actually prepare and protect themselves before they're breached. And the third piece of that is, is that if information is encrypted or uses another type of uh, security technology that makes the data that has been uh, uh, exposed uh, either unreadable or unusable, uh, either in transit or at rest, that that should be a standard for uh, baseline of reporting. Essentially, it creates an environment where you don't get into over-reporting then uh, 
if, if in fact the information has not been exposed and there's been no harm. Does it matter if the government has a golden key to that encryption? Hmm, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I, so it describes this, me what this golden key looks like? <laughs> yeah, it's somewhere in Hogwarts, I believe. <laughs> um, I think, I, obviously, I, I think most people would like to see federal data breach legislation. Obviously, the, the, the big conflict is going to be how strong is, is it? What are the standards for disclosure? I think the concern in the privacy community is right now what's been proposed is not as strong as some of those mm -hmm. 48 uh, uh, laws. And so we'll see how that goes, although right now it seems like information sharing is, is the top priority for the White House on this issue as Alex rolls his eyes. Um, do we have any other questions? Or any, anything uh, that's appropriate uh, for a G rating on the internet? A G rating? Or PG. PG's There's okay. a question. It's, a, it's an adult. It's an adult. Oh, where is it? Hi, Igor Miklich from RAN. With regard to data breach, are liabilities today in, in our society in the right place for that? And in particular, for example, for an average citizen who gets his identity stolen as a result of a target breach, target doesn't seem to be liable for that. Or perhaps I misunderstand that. Your thoughts? So, I I think the the the, the liability um, sort of goes back to sort of a, a really interesting question that I sort of watch people talk about today, um, which is you know it's who who's liable when you're breached and sort of breached by whom I guess is is the question right? Because I mean people sort of talked about the Sony breach and so forth right? Like if Sony is breached by some random hackers, then it's on Sony. If Sony is breached by North Korea, maybe it's on the US Gov, um, right? Which, which actually becomes really interesting, especially since this sort of goes back to, I think, when you're sort of talking about, about nation state threats yeah. and, and that sort of thing, right? Like, you know, when, when Google is breached by China, the US government is your friend. When the US government is stealing Google's data via unencrypted lease lines, maybe not so much. Um, so you've sort of got this kind of frenemies thing going on, right? Um, which, which I think it makes it really difficult in terms of discussing, like, you know, where's, where's the liability there? For instance, you know, was Google liable for all that customer data going missing when the US government stole it? Um, or, you know, again, you know, is, is, is Sony liable now? Um, I, think it's, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I find it difficult to, you know, sort of put the, the liability line. But these, as a sort of a security engineer, I guess these are my things that go through my head when I think about threats and where my data is likely to go. I just gave a whole speech on respecting the fact that people have professions, so I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer right now. I would just say I'd be careful in any situation where you want to disincentivize companies from providing free services to billions of people. All right. Well, we are just about out of time and going to be transitioning to some final comments from my boss, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Uh, but first, I'll tell a little story about her that's relevant <laughs> to what we just talked about. Um, you mentioned Ashkan Sultani, FTC technologist. Uh, prior to that gig, he was doing a panel at New America, and we were talking about this problem of the technology pipeline and how do we get more technologists into DC. And he mentioned this cultural difference and mentioned um, in the panel, he was like, for example, I know that you have technologists on staff at New America, but that you also have a dress code where you can't wear jeans except on Friday. Um, Emery was still relatively new at the time and was shocked to hear this. We expect people to code in slacks. Um, <laughs> and, and the next day the, the uh, dress code was, was revoked. And so uh, there it is, people. The answer to cybersecurity is letting people wear hoodies in DC. 